the podcast. We have a special guest today. Uh, now, help me say your last name right. I've said it wrong. Gilpin. 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 Yeah. So Greg Gilpin, composer. He is here uh, at the recommendation of my good friend Dan Davison, and we've interacted a couple of times at ACDA events, which is a, a choral thing. So my orchestra kids just calm down for a second we're gonna dabble in the choir world and <laughs> you will recover i promise yes uh, <laughs> uh and i was a band guy so okay great <laughs> yeah i played trumpet and i well i played cornet and i played french horn and i was an all-state french horn player in missouri wow congratulations yeah uh and at, at any rate the music at its basic function is universal and uh greg has a really unique ability to produce music for any ensemble and make them sound really, really good. So, uh, Greg, before we start talking about that, I, I put the cart before the horse. Would you just tell us a little bit about yourself and okay. how you got to where you are and what you're doing now? Well, okay. Um, <laughs> I think everything was by accident. I don't know. I uh, <laughs> was always very involved with music growing up. Uh -huh. um, I grew up in the church. I played piano since before I could read, which... <laughs> back then was like four years old. They read it two years old now, so that's not <laughs> quite a big deal as it used to be. But <laughs> I, uh, I always, always played piano, and I always sang, and, and did that. Then I was in band in beginning in fifth grade. Uh, that's when we started band, and I played, um, I learned cornet. I wanted to be a drummer, but uh, my parents wouldn't let me be a drummer, so I, I learned cornet, and, uh, and then I played French horn in high school, uh, and we, I grew up in a very small town. Uh, we had 800 people. I had 28 in my graduating class. Uh, mm. So the football players would, um, they, they would march in their own halftime show, you know, uh, <laughs> for it. So it was little, but um, we had great teachers. Um, I would say 70% of the school was in music, if not more. Mm. And we did musicals and we did very well uh, at contests. I really had a great uh, choral teacher uh, who was my um, uh, sister-in-law. Uh, her name was Sherry Bannon Gilpin later on, and Larry Hiltbittle was my band teacher, very well known in Missouri. Okay. And uh, anyway, um, I was very involved. I played keyboards all the time. I accompanied, I accompanied in college, um, got my vocal music degree K through 12. Um, and then I uh, did not want to full-time teach um, because I didn't want the paycheck. Uh, I thought I would get trapped in a paycheck and I wouldn't try other things. Uh -huh. And um, so I always did part-time teaching, worked with a lot of teachers, and then I taught voice and piano. I moved to Indiana and I did a lot of studio work and that type of thing. And then I got involved with background singing um, and lots of things like that. But the whole time I was writing, arranging, uh, teaching, mm -hmm. um, I never left music education and everything I did on, you know, out there mm -hmm. um, with uh, performance part, it always applied to my uh, writing and all that. Well, and um, that lead, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's something no. that I try to encourage my students all the time is that when we think about careers in music, yeah. it's not... Uh, teaching orchestra or choir or band or being in Seattle Symphony, it, it, those aren't your, your only two options. There's a, a whole world out oh, there, yeah. and you've just described at least eight out of the 3,000. Oh, yeah, there's, there's lots of things. And we generally, as a musician, you do a lot of different jobs, but there are jobs. You can be a lawyer. Uh, you can be a doctor. Uh, there's lots of musical uh, things you can do that are not just teaching. Not mm -hmm. that that's just a just, but we, that's all kids see as a music teacher. And there's a lot of other things you can do with a music degree in different areas. Mm. Yeah. So, so tell us, what, what do you do now and, and mm -hmm. what, uh, what okay. gets you excited these days? Well, I write, um, I write and arrange for any publisher that will publish me. <laughs> um, they're all my friends. I have really good editors and uh, I'm lucky that way. Um, and I really, um, I really respect my editors, mm. um, and um, I learn a lot from them ever uh, from day one. Um, I listen to them, I learn from them, and um, and then I'm also director of educational choral publications uh, for a publisher named Shawnee Press, 
who is actually under the umbrella of Al Leonard. And uh, I, uh, I edit, I work with all, all kinds of other writers, I review music, mm -hmm. um, I record it, um, I record for other publishers. Um, so it's very involved uh, with that. And I learn a lot because I get to uh, be with, a, I get to see a lot of writing and a lot of other writers. And the newest and stuff out there. Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, right now, you know, our whole industry is on a halt. Um, yeah. And I'm hoping, you know, we have brand new music for next year. I don't know what's going to happen because we were to release new music this month. Uh -huh. And nobody's in school. So I don't know really what the, uh, I don't think anybody knows what the plan is. Uh, well, but, you know, we'll see. There's a whole bunch of new music to be that seen. We're going to miss music so badly. Uh -huh. By the time this is over, that yeah. that we're gonna dig right back in and twice as deep. Yeah, I really, I mean, I hope, but I really think that there's gonna be a renaissance of music and art uh, because we're missing it. And I have told a lot of people who are not musicians, I go, regardless of music, just all the creative arts, you guys better appreciate it because it's not happening so all your netflix movies and uh -huh. all the music you're listening to yep. it's not happening now they're not recording they're not working movies all of that we're we're going to get a lot of leftovers that aren't out yet and uh it's going to be a while when the industry gets back so everybody enjoy what you're watching you're listening to and when <laughs> and when it all comes back on you better support it all the symphonies mm -hmm. our symphony here in indianapolis which is a fantastic mm, course, organization. Yes. They just all got furloughed and uh, they're going to wait. Yeah. And, you know, I hope they, I, you know, I hope we have one, but I mean, we yeah. have a really strong organization, but it's really, really I mean, no, no matter how you slice it, if there's not money coming in, you, yeah, yeah. There's, there's not too many choices. Yeah. No, what? I work with people in my own publishing that have been furloughed that, you know, it's just, <laughs> It's really hard because everybody has to cut back a little bit until we're back in production. Mm hmm Yeah. Well, if maybe we can take a, a turn towards the brighter side of life. Yeah. Here. So as, as I'm starting out as a teacher mm -hmm. and composition was a, a passion of mine, uh, but I was out in this ethereal, I'm going to be Gustav Mahler meets Bruckner meets, you know, <laughs> Brahms meets... Philip Glass, for some reason, also. Uh, and all of my composition teachers were trying to make that box a little bit smaller and more confined. And then I meet my colleague, Dan Davison. And as you're talking about editing, editing can be a, a really, really difficult thing if for the, the creator of the content. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because every time he says, your pianist isn't going to want to play that chord. Because I, I, I can use a piano. I'm, I'm a functional pianist, but I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go around accompanying anybody's choir. And so I'm writing just a little octavo and a SSAA, and I've got a piano part. And he's saying, no, you can't do that because the pianist won't play that chord. <laughs> and and I, I wanted to have an argument with him, and I made it so personal. That, well, that's the chord I wanted. I'm the composer, yeah. Dan. Right. Um, but to sit down and have the understanding that he's thinking about it as a pianist is going to sit down and look at this that is reading it at a publishing company, at a publishing house, thinking about uh, what's going to be marketable. And one of the things, and, and I'm not in your business, so I, I won't put words in your mouth, but I would expect one of the things you're looking for is a piece that's easy to read, that it reads well. And if the piano part is chunky, that's going to create some problems for you if you want to get published. Right. Um, yes, I would agree. Every, everything you're saying is correct. Um, as a creator, it's really hard to be edited sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but now when I, I do, like I said, I have really good relationships with my editors and I trust them and they do give me, you know, they do give me feedback and go, uh, I don't know about this, don't know about this, um, but um, most of the time, they know what they want in their catalog, uh -huh. and I've learned to write for different editors. Yes. What works, 
you know, for one doesn't always work for another. Mm -hmm. um, and um, now as the editor, you're exactly right. Um, we're always, you know, although, yes, we are trying to um, get the biggest market. We also, um, I think, have a responsibility uh, to publish for other little markets that need certain things. Mm -hmm. um, we just can't do everything and we can't do all for this one and this one. We need to do the big one, uh -huh. you know, and then, and it doesn't always, um, I don't think it always has to read well immediately, but, um, or let's say this, read uh, correctly. It, I think it needs to read well. And I think a music director will look at it and go, oops, oops, I messed that up. But yeah, that makes sense. I can do it now. They, they get it. And uh -huh. um, yeah, and I think also um, as an editor, we have to, um, believe that the director has a brain and <laughs> we don't have to put everything in the music that they need to be able yeah. to make music with it themselves. Um, but, um, the biggest, we do have to try to sell music. That is it. You know, and, and something in the choral field that y'all have going for you that, that I wish existed in the, the, or, the string orchestra specifically, it does exist in band, but You've got the the SAB arrangement. Mm. You've got the SSA arrangement. You've got a right. TPB arrangement. Yeah. And uh, there's all kinds of flex band where it's you know everything is there's really just three parts going on and any number of instruments can play it. Okay. But it, in in orchestra, it's either a, a two part partner song kind of situation that's just so easy and so uninteresting mm -hmm. or it's uh you know written for the concert hall and you need to bring in the professionals we we just haven't cr oh, carved no, out no, no, and when you were talking about writing for specific publishers something that motivates me as a composer is when i know the exact people i'm writing for mm. i know that if uh, so i'm writing for this choir and I've uh, maybe I've sung with them like uh, there's an adult group out of PLU Choral Union where a lot of the the uh, alumni still sing. And if I know who the altos are for the next concert, I know where the breaks are going to be, and I know what to avoid. And yeah. and that makes composing easier for me. Yes. And then I can produce a piece that makes that group sound better. Yeah, that, and that's our job when we get a commission. Mm. You know, we write the commission. Generally, I would say at least 70% is what, you know, the choir needs. They might have special things like we always divide our altos. <laughs> okay. That's not always the case in choir America. You know, the altos aren't always divided or the tenors are rarely divided, you know, in just mm -hmm. uh, a general piece. But you do, you write um, to that. And then um, when I do that, uh, when I, I might adjust it then when I send it in uh, to one of my editors, knowing, you know, that won't work, you know, to be published. It works great for that choir. Now I've got to adjust it mm -hmm. and I've got to make it work for the marketing and for, you know, everybody. Well, uh, but yeah, I get a lot of, I get a lot of pieces like that. I go, wow, this is a great commission. I don't know who's going to buy it. You know, we're going to have to simplify the piano part. Uh, or whatever it is. And uh, most of the time, the, uh, I have really good writers that are great about that. There, there's on occasion, I get a lot of pushback on something and I'm going, well, I love it, but I can't publish it now, you know? Uh -huh. And as you're uh, producing or editing or, or sort of test driving things with just a select group of people, like maybe just making the, the reference recording, uh, <laughs> Where do you draw the line with this is very fun or we need this to challenge this group? Because right. at some point, if it's not fun anymore, it's really not worth doing with your ensemble. Right. But if all we do is fun, we're not going to move on to the, the next step. Yeah. So how do you ride that line? Yeah, it is really hard. And I think that's where you find your good arrangers and composers. They know uh -huh. how to do that. And I think those are also the people 
Um, I mean, uh, you know, my personal experience, I conduct a lot of kids throughout the year and um, I get an idea of what they can do, what they can't, at least in my experience, and then I apply that. So I want a piece that has a wonderful text. I know that doesn't apply to your band and your orchestra, but <laughs> unfortunately with vocalists, we mess everything up because now we have to sing words with it. So uh, we have words that they need to be able to relate to and learn from. Um, I do not believe, I don't like pieces that are strictly Alleluia or the Sopranos have the words and everybody else sings and ooing. Or ooing. Yeah. Who wants to do that for three months in a rehearsal? Not me. Well, and, and call yeah. it cliched, but that's what, uh, hand over fist, I would love to sing a Moses Hogan arrangement over some other spiritual because even if I'm singing ten or two, which is usually some the most boring part, they he puts in the words that nobody else gets with these really cool rhythms. Yeah, that that give more meaning to the text. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Everybody has something interesting. Um, altos, you know, there are times I'll conduct something I wrote, and I'll look at the altos and I go, um, I think you owe me a thank you because. You have a really interesting part, Altos. And so they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, or they have the melody. If nothing else, just the Altos have the melody, you know, which is nice. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, you've got to find balance. But I also, I tell people, you know, Yelena Sharkova, are you familiar with Yelena Sharkova? Look her Nathan, up. Very familiar. Look her up. She <laughs> is definitely a mentor of mine. Okay. And we had this discussion about music uh, maybe being too simple or, or yeah. getting, getting that feedback. And she goes, Greg, I get feedback like this all the time from state uh, uh, conventions when I'm asked to do their all state. Yeah. She goes, because they think my music's too simple. And I'm, she goes, I tell them, you don't know what I'm going to do with it. You have no idea what I'm going to do with this. And I think there needs to be a point where you're done learning the music and you need to now take time and make music out of it. And believe me, a well, whole note is really hard to make musical sometimes. And music isn't just ink on paper. That's right. Music is sound. No, the right. Ink on paper is very boring. Yeah. And we can do, <clears throat> like it with a whole note, if we do it right, we can take a whole note and we can make you feel something That's right. that reminds you of a very specific childhood memory or, right. or, or, or something to that degree. That's right. That's right. It, it, there is a lot to be done. I always tell teachers this as well. I go, look, my job is I give you a whole palette of colors in this, in this piece. You have this big canvas. I've given you all these um, palettes of color and I've given you a few directions. I've given you um, ideas on brush strokes, uh, ideas on what brushes to use, but you now get to paint, you know, mm -hmm. the painting with everything. And I go, the way you do my piece may be different the way than they do it. And that's the beauty of choral but, music. It's different voices, and different nothing choir. nothing makes me more frustrated than when I go to an, an orchestra uh, festival or competition and somebody's doing Brandenburg five ba -da -dum, ba -da -dum, ba -da -dum, or maybe it's three I mix them up all the time one of those numbers and and somebody says that the the emphasis has to be on this syllable and somebody else says the emphasis <laughs> is on this syllable yeah and um, there's a, a great TED talk by oh I always forget his first name and I brought him up on my podcast more than once Applebaum is his last name and the, the whole podcast is about what is music. Mm. And so he shows a guy that's chopping up vegetables and it's put through some kind of distortion filter. And then he's got one where it's audio cues matched up with uh, sign language. Mm. Um, and, it, you know, he keeps coming back to the question of, is it music? And in the end, that's the wrong question. It's, is it interesting? Mm. So there is no, right, like you're saying with the, the canvas, there's no one way to interpret the piece, no. but how can you use the, the paint and the palette and the brushes that you right. and the composer provided to make a painting that's all your own? And do you enjoy it? That's Maybe right. As the composer, I might think things are a little gauche, 
but did your ensemble, you know, connect with that music and connect with each other? Yes. When I did it, I did a concert at Carnegie. And I won't, I won't say who the other director was because they're fantastic. And the choir was fantastic. Um, they were the high school group. I did the middle school. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I do a lot of middle school because... That's where I the real work is happening. Having I don't think nobody wants to do middle school because mm -hmm. it's so hard. <laughs> it's difficult. But I, I did the middle school and um, we, did, we, we did, we were first, we did ours. And then I sat and I watched the high school scene. Mm -hmm. And what I, my takeaway was, and I always do this now, is I watched them and I thought, you know what? They are technically uh, perfect, you know, just musical and it's wonderful, but they didn't sing with any joy. There was no joy in the choir. Now my middle schoolers, you know, I had 300 <laughs> of them up there. Uh -huh. They worked. Oh, we worked on our vowels and we sang and not everything was perfect, but they sang with joy. They enjoyed it so much. And I went, bingo, that's my job. They have to sing with joy and enjoy the process. If there were three things that when I retire, my students tattoo on my face, one of them would be that an audience listens 80% with their eyes. <laughs> yeah. So. Here's the question that we've been leading to now for 10, 20 minutes is you've gotten the right piece of music for the right group. It's been well prepared. It looks, it looks lovely. You have all the right indications and the, the students are excited to per perform this piece of music. How do you convince them that it is important that they enjoy making music with each other, yeah. not just the piece of paper? Well, I think we're learning that now, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're not getting to be together. Mm -hmm. I think it's not happening, happening naturally. Um, I get a lot of feedback from teachers when they get there, you know, they'll do a Zoom with their ensembles mm -hmm. and the kids are just like, I just wanna see everybody. I wanna talk to everybody, I wanna be with everybody. And um, when, you, when you get to the point, I think actually, if, you're, if your choir is already enjoying it and they're doing all those things, mm -hmm. I think they must be enjoying being together. Mm -hmm. I think it's the groups that are broken up and you can tell they aren't blending and yeah. one part doesn't know what the other part's playing. Those are the groups that, are, that have no idea that there should be a connection. They don't even know each other's names. Well, you know? and, and it doesn't, it doesn't always have anything to do with their actual talent or ability. They can oh, right. individually be very talented singers. Uh, but uh, from your expertise, what makes it so important that a group of musicians get along and make music together yes. rather than simultaneously? Yeah, I, I totally think they get, they need to know who they are, uh, who, who each other are. They don't, you've got to do some things that are, non-musical you they need to get to know you literally like um one of the there's a great um there's a great book called icebreakers by valerie mack mm -hmm. one of the little icebreakers in there is um um uh, teacher's pet i like to call it getting to know you but it's teacher's mm -hmm. pet and just the idea of your kids getting to know you um the idea is the teacher on monday um, in rehearsal, they go, hey, you guys, I'm going to give you a pop quiz on Friday. And it's going to be over all the things we talked about this week uh, mm -hmm. in rehearsal or class or whatever it is. And what you do is you share, <clears throat> you share little things about yourself all week long. Maybe a book you're reading, mm -hmm. maybe a movie, uh, maybe where you grew up, any of those things all week long. Then on Friday, you remind them, guess what? We've got a quiz, but all the quiz questions are about you and they have to answer the things like what was your favorite book what was the movie just little things like that take five minutes and do some exercises with each other where they learn that everybody like the majority of the group loves country music i didn't know that you guys love country music maybe you should do something with country music and, and a piece 
Um, but I think they need to really, if you don't know each other, you will never make beautiful music. You come in and you're strangers, uh-uh, ain't gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. And you don't have to be a great musician, but you're gonna be a better musician if you know the ensemble and the people around and, you. And this know. whole topic is something that people in the orchestra world, they need to get on the choir train. Because even in my orchestra, there are, and I don't enjoy it, I'm not proud of it, there's a couple of kids that just sit in the back and they don't really talk to anybody else. And you're lucky if they even play that day. Mm. But it, 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 it's not worth singling them out and making them feel guilty about it and stopping your whole rehearsal. It's right. a private conversation later. But just that one person choosing not to be part of the family, part of the team, kills the vibe. It, it ruins the, yeah. that, that kind of, that spark in the energy of making music together. You know, I would really, I would have to sit and think about that. Um, I, I'm thinking of all the roadblocks in an orchestra because I was in band. Um, I think there's a roadblock because nobody else gets to see anybody other's part. They only hear uh -huh. it. Uh -huh. And vocally and choral, we see You're everything. at everybody's part, yes. And because we're in the same key, uh, relative key, we get to, I can have the guy sing the alto part. In, in yeah. But now when you do that, I mean, the first thing I thought was, well, you know what, clarinets, play the string line. Well, now they can't because they can't really <laughs> do that. So they can't relate. And so I think you have, they have, and, and I think um, instrumentalists have big ears anyway. Vocalists have gigantic mouths and talk, 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 talk. Instrumentalists are very, here's my music, this is what I play, this is what I play. When I was in band and orchestra, I was listening to everybody and critiquing them. <laughs> well, like, and the, the best orchestras are the ones that do that. When, if you've ever adjudicated at a, a, a state contest and you see the, the orchestras walking through or the string quartets walking through the hallway, the ones that do really well, they're making puns. They have inside jokes with each other. They're yeah. joshing around. Yeah. They're, they're being little punks. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not so much so no, that way that they're going to get thrown out. Uh, <laughs> but when you see the four kids that look like they've never met before, mm -hmm. and then you hear them, uh, it's, they could be competent musicians. It could be very in tune and rhythmically accurate. But they don't play well together. But that spark is just, it's gone. Now, could you do this? Um, I do this a lot with choirs where it's fun about, you know, when you sing your part, but I also have them listen uh, to, I'll, I'll have the guys listen to only the girls. Yeah. Or I'll have the tenors listen to the alto. Could you do that with your orchestra and band go, okay, stop. I want trumpets to listen to the flutes right now. And I want you to help the flutes out. Here's the flute part, flutes play. Trumpets, you have to answer me. Trumpet one, how can they do better? Or what did they do mm. great? What did they mm. do great in that? What did, they, and maybe, and so but, they all have to start listening and, and be aware. The of barrier the we're breaking here is that it's not about band, choir, orchestra. It's about making music and being a good music educator. Mm -hmm. Well, and then I would say trumpets, do you have a line like that in your part? Oh, you do, where is it? <laughs> Oh, you're playing what the flutes play here. Well, could you sound a little more flute-like instead of blaring it so loud? I, I don't know. You know, but I. And you if know, you wanted to be aware. really tricky, the flutes could be doing that part particularly well, and maybe the trumpets don't know that they're not doing it, right? Or, or that they're playing it wrong. Exactly. And you can tell the trumpets they're wrong without ever making them feel guilty about it. Exactly. Exactly. I do that the same way with the, with the vocal parts. I'm going, do you like that better? Do you like what they're doing? And they'll go, yeah, that sounds really good. And I said, you know, you, you sing the same part mm -hmm. over here. <laughs> do you sound like that? And they're like, no. <laughs> like, uh, well, there's a good example of how you want you to play it. You know, there's a, a, a classic Richard Nance move. And I love the man to pieces. Uh, he would stop and have one group do a measure a couple of times. And if it was more than three, you knew the next thing he was going to do was say, okay, quartets. Mm. So you knew if he was isolating that one spot, that was your chance. Yeah. And it was, you know, the, they, they're the ones singing it right. So yeah. everybody listen to them and then we'll all do it together. And then 
you still didn't do right. Let's let's hear the right example. Hey. And then because that is a you know premier top level ensemble where you can yeah. make those kinds of choices. Yeah. Then the hammer came down and it was one on a part. Well, I mean, our job is to assess as well. Oh. We are constantly assessing. And what a great way to go. Okay, we're gonna do uh, we're gonna do uh, you know quintets or quartets, whatever you want to do in your orchestra. But I want I'm gonna have a trumpet three. Uh, I want flute four. I want clarinet, soprano, blah blah blah. I want you all to play your part together now from this to this number, mm -hmm. and have them play individually and go hmm, okay. And just they don't have to play alone, yep. but they're playing alone in their section, mm -hmm. which is scary. And, and for the teachers watching this, and, and, and I hope you'll agree with me to some degree, I never test a student alone in front of their peers. Right. Even if it, I know it's the one kid, and maybe everybody else knows it's the one student, I would never single them out. It would be, can I have you four? Yes, right. I agree. I agree. It's, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm a very introverted person. I would have been... Um, yeah, I was always mortified to be alone and to do that. I needed, I needed, I'm like that now. No, sing with me. Yeah. Sing with me. <laughs> Don't let me be alone on this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is the magic of ensemble work. Uh -huh. Right there, you just proved about how important it is. It's uh, of, of performing and working together, not alone. Mm. Well, uh, using that as a pivot point, now that we are kind of all alone, mm -hmm. if we can speak to the teachers here, uh, I'm doing a pretty good job of staying calm and just taking it one day at a time. Because yep. I know the families at home, they're getting so many emails from all of their teachers. And I know a lot of parents out there are just overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Because yes. uh, maybe they're out of work and now they have to take care of all of their kids full time. And they have they to be a teacher. And they have to be the teacher. Um, and they're getting mixed signals from all of the teachers at school because we can't agree right. what because we're all trying to do because we're this well, is the first new. time we're doing this it's we, brand new we're just trying to make it work so how can we keep a cool head and and do our best to keep some semblance of learning going for kids uh, but also ourselves as teachers uh stay calm and use each other as a network of support this is what I've learned in the last month. Um, uh, and this is from a lot of teachers, because um, I've been doing interviews with teachers and things. And most of the time, know, first of all, know your kids want to be together. And mm -hmm. they most probably 95% want to be with you. I think there's a lot of teachers finding out what they're good at, what themselves as teachers are good at, what they're not good at, what relationships they thought they had, and what they have now, they thought they had a better relationship with a student, mm -hmm. whatever. I think you're finding out who the leaders are, and who the followers are, and the ones that don't care at all, and the ones that really care and they want to help. So all that, I think you have to give yourself grace that you have not done this before. And as long as you're doing little things. It may not be, I really think, I've had so many teachers say in the past, well, you know, I would work on that if I had time. I just don't have time for that. Well, you oh, I work on that now. <laughs> if I had time. You got lots of time now. So you know what, For if you're gonna meet with them for half an hour, or you got a private student or whatever it is, um, mm -hmm. work on basic things. Work on, get them singing. Mm -hmm. Get them doing warm ups. Get listen to them. Go to your kids and go. I want you to teach me. Okay, let's look at this music. I don't want you to tell me how you would interpret this text. I don't know. Just give a little weight on that. Another level of learning we never would have had time. That's for. right. We never take time for that. We never take time to go talk about the dynamics with me. Okay, we just let's just sit for a minute, and all we're going to do is talk dynamics and the reason why that composer. We're, we're a ranger, put that dynamic there. And that's gonna be our lesson today. And, and even the most avant-garde or eclectic uh, institutions of music education or just education out there are still producing teachers that operate under a model of 
I stand and deliver and you as the student receive. And maybe sometimes that's involving a fun little game where they get up and move because mm -hmm. movement is becoming more included in our teaching, mm -hmm. which is great. I, I have, I, I think that's a step in the right direction. Uh, but to actually turn the table around like you've suggested and say, yeah. you teach me. Yeah. Because now you understand what they don't understand. That's right. How many times you know, when, when I'm coming up against a kid that, why, why can't you play your C sharp? Right. Because well, I don't understand what they don't understand. And think about this. This is all happening at the end of the school year. Yeah. You've been teaching for a long time. <laughs> it's March and April, now going into May. We're in the middle of April. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out if they learned anything this past year. Because oh, they yeah. Expect everything in August or September, whenever you go back, uh -huh. we will be back together again. Yes. And you're back together again. I guarantee you teachers are going to be teaching differently. Mm -hmm. And I think kids are going to be learning differently. Yeah. And uh, so give yourself grace as long as you're teaching out something. It is not going to be what you think it's going to be. It's going to be little, 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 um, uh, as you say, rewards, but little triumphs here and there uh -huh. of learning with these kids. It's as difficult for them to learn as it is for you to teach. Well, and uh, it, for teachers out here, out there who still haven't started the online learning, something that I would ask them to consider. This was my first assignment. We use Google Classroom where I am. My first assignment was just send me a one, two, or a three. One, I'm doing well and I have everything I need. Two, I'm doing okay, but I, I need my instrument or I need, uh, I, I have some supplies that I need. Uh -huh. And three, I need someone I trust to reach out. Because we, we got to consider that not all these kids are going home to, if this is their learning environment, they're not going home to an equitable learning environment. No. So if you haven't sent out that first assignment yet, even though that maybe doesn't achieve your musical goals, you are making sure that everyone has the tools they need to continue learning. Yeah. And, and I think we need to identify as soon as possible who who do we need to take care of? Who's yeah, going to need that love to keep learning? Because everybody's got to keep learning. Everybody has a right to continue this, learning. This whole online thing right now is the first day of your teaching career. It's uh -huh. that day you walk in and go, well, who do I have here in the classroom? You, <laughs> you need to figure that out now because you've got this whole different classroom. And believe me, your kids... Um, there are going to be a few of them that don't act right. They're not the kids uh -huh. you knew. Um, because, as you said, I, I just worry so bad about the kids um, that go home to a, a very not very good home. And um, music and school was their, that was their structure. And their family. And that was their family. And uh, we have a lot of that. Did you know this, though? You know, a lot of, a lot of states... They don't even have internet. There are music teachers that aren't getting to teach anything. They have to mail it. There are rural places in Missouri, in lots of these states that are very rural, uh -huh. that they don't even have Google what? I mean, they don't have this. Yeah. Imagine if you are able to teach by Zoom or by anything with your kids, then you need to know you are up here already in a great spot because there are teachers so frustrated and kids so frustrated that they have nothing. They, they're not doing any teaching. And a little a kickstand tangent off of that is, if you are up here and you do have Google whatever and Zoom and all of the resources, think about the kid who's only got one computer at home. Yes, they do have internet, but mom needs it to work. That's right. So if they ask you or, don't even wait for them to ask you. Make a paper alternative and don't complain about it. Yeah. Because everybody's got to keep learning. Everybody has a right to continue their education. And, and that's right. And if they don't mail it back, they don't mail it back. Just, you know, make a note of all of this. Keep track uh -huh. of all this. Give everybody grace about this. But what a great conversation to have with that student, maybe when you see them again, is going, so what was going on? How come you wouldn't mail it back? Maybe there's a legitimate reason why they couldn't mail it back, but Absolutely. there's no way for them to tell you. I don't know. 
Well, I'm the for for all of the experience that you have in education as as the teacher and as someone who is just coming in to help out and check out things and uh, maybe uh, provide insight for somebody who's having a, a rough go of it. The kid who seems like they don't care or maybe is skipping class yeah. is that's not the kid that you don't need to worry about. That's exactly the kid you need to worry about. Sure, absolutely. The, the less they care about you, the more you have to care about them because there is a reason that they think that school is boring or that nothing matters. There is a reason. Yeah, and I would reach out to that person and go, I miss you. You know, talk to them and go, write them a note if you're not getting to mail it to them and go, I miss you as a student. I cannot wait to see you again in my class. Even though they may have not been very good in your class, if you reach out to them, that may change everything the way they are with you. Uh -huh. Teachers have got, uh, myself included, there is some baggage that we just need to let go of. Yes. Whatever happened in October where, you know, Jimmy would not stop yeah. standing on the top of the desk drawer. Right. We've got to get over it. <laughs> right. Because right. There, there's other things going on, and we got to make sure that everybody has equal access. Yeah. Be the one that reaches stuff. out. Be the one that just offers. I really, th that's good karma. And I think that will just come back to you mm -hmm. uh, with those students. I, I say this all the time. It, it never makes me feel bad to do service for others. Yeah. And the, the same way that you never regret a workout. Right. If you have an opportunity, to, like make, right before you maybe go like for a five mile run, you're thinking, oh, God, I had a hard day at work and I just eat, ate lasagna and this is not going to feel good. But I'm just going to go do it. But when you're done, it's like, oh, what a relief. And yeah. I'm so glad I did that. <laughs> and it's the same way with service yeah. to others. Yeah, I think uh, when I get a little down, every day I told teachers, you know, there's one day I'm angry, one day I'm sad, one day I'm happy. You know, every day has its own emotion lately. Uh -huh. um, but um, my, um, I know a person that is in recovery and he was talking about, when he gets in this bubble of, you know, upset or maybe he's uh, tempted or whatever, his, uh, his sponsor one time, um, he said to him, hey, you know what I want you to do right now? And he said, what? He said, I want you to go to Walmart. Now, we can't do this right now. Well, I guess you could, but I want you to go to Walmart. I don't want you to push all the carts that are out in the parking lot. I want you to gather those up and take them back into the front of the store. Uh -huh. And he was like, what? what? He goes, if you don't do this, I won't be your sponsor anymore. I said, once you go out there, because you need to get out of your head and you need to go help somebody else instead of trying to take care of you for a minute. Mm -hmm. And that is a great metaphor for me. I'm thinking, I need to go push some carts back to the, out of the parking lot and I need to get out of my bubble, do something for somebody else today. Absolutely. And that may be one of your students. You're like going, that kid is driving me crazy. I'm gonna write a really nice note to him. Uh huh. Well, uh, as we put a cap on this conversation, I've got two questions left. One of them I ask all of my guests. The other one is, is kind of just for you. Is if I feel like I'm at my wit's end and I don't feel like I'm getting anything done with my kids, or maybe, and this is not my case at all, but somebody else listening out there, maybe they don't feel supported as a music educator, uh, how, can, how can we reach out to them and give them the support that they need? And how can they feel empowered uh, and, and valid in asking for that help? Well, if, 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 when you first was asking, I was thinking they need to do a little bit of self-care um, mm -hmm. because I think most of it's just your, your interpretation of it, of what you're imagining. I think you have to remember um, that the person that maybe you're not getting the support from, it might be your principal, it might be, you need to imagine everything they are going through right now. Oh, yes. And you need to maybe back off mm -hmm. and you need to be a good um, employee right now. And you need to just do, you know, if you're, do, you might check in with them and saying, 
this is what I'm doing. Are you pleased? Are you okay with this? Is this what I'm trying to do? Get maybe a feedback from them where they can simply say yes, no. Yeah, they're probably going to go, yes, just keep doing what you're doing. Okay, great. I would also maybe go back in the beginning part of the year. If you have anything recorded and you have some choir videos, maybe remind you, mind your, remind yourself of what you were teaching and how mm -hmm. wonderful they were together and that you will do this again. But maybe just a little self-care going, oh, we really have a nice choir. We're going to be okay. We are going to be okay. Exactly that. I was uh, the last week when they announced that school would be canceled the rest of the year. And, and I absolutely respect that decision for, for our, our well-being sure. and, and the people in our community and in our country. Uh, but I'm sitting there having an ugly cry. There's no two ways about it. It's okay. I, I pull out my phone and I look up the videos I have saved. And we, we had a performance three days before school was closed. And I didn't keep crying. I didn't cry harder. And it brought a smile to my face. And my wife walks in the room, and she probably thinks I'm a weirdo, looking at my phone, <laughs> crying and smiling. And she says, what is happening? She's like, I just have the most amazing students. Yeah. And I'm, is, I'm there a way, is there a way you shared that with your students? Yeah, absolutely. Share, I would suggest that to teachers. If there's a way to share that video, they need reminders of what they were doing and how good they were and go, look what we were doing. We're going to get to do this again. It's just right now we're not. But let's remember what we did. I want to share yeah, that. What with we you. did together. And what we did together. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. OK, so my last question. And, and maybe this is a toughie. Um, if you can remember a time in your life when you were pursuing music and maybe um, think about it as a career or at a turning point where music was becoming more serious or more important and someone or something was more or less telling you no. Mm. If you could go back in time, what would you tell yourself to get through that that period or that that struggle well i th I'm, I'm thinking of a couple of times but one in particular um was very hurtful um and i don't know if i ever did get over it but another another just basic thing is probably um when i was told you know, maybe I wasn't playing something or I didn't know as much as maybe the, another musician in the band or whatever was happening. And um, I would tell myself now, not that I didn't do this, but I would do it more now. I would have went, then I want you to teach me how to do that. Instead, mm. I separated myself from the person criticizing me. Mm -hmm. And what I should have done is going, you know what, you're right. I would love to learn, will you teach me how to do that? You got 10 minutes, mm -hmm. you got 30 minutes. And I would have connected more with that person because I actually think that person wanted to be the one to teach. I think they wanted yeah. to go, I'm gonna show you how to do this, but I didn't let them do it. I went, oh, 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 I don't know how to do it. Uh, and then I would be upset or whatever. Or it I is learned. so hard to choose that growth mindset when, we, are, when we feel hurt. And, and when and you're in it, right. And especially with choir. Yes, with band and orchestra, but especially with choir, when your performance is being criticized, your voice is you. Yeah. It's not a sound you made with an instrument. It's you. you. And when someone tells you it's bad, it feels like you're bad. Uh-huh. And so we, we've, we need to choose this growth mindset of, okay, what happened was not perfect yet. Can you help me make it better? Yeah, and even if you don't agree, give them a moment and just go, even if, it, you know, especially with the voice, it's okay. a different voice and they're incredibly oh, yeah. good. I mean, they just have this natural talent that maybe I don't have. But I would go, how do you do that? Tell mm -hmm. me, oh, that's amazing. I'm not sure I can do that, but that is amazing. You know, that's mm -hmm. basically, usually they're feeling insecure themselves. Uh -huh. 
So turn the tables and reach out to that person that may be criticizing you. I would, I would do that now if I had that, if I knew that now, knew that then, I would have done that. I'd be a better musician. And there were lots of times I did do that, but um, there are a few times I didn't. And I didn't connect with that person, and that person was talented. Well, the, this question has given me flashbacks of it in the Choir of the West, which is a you know Scandinavian choir sound, pure tone, no vibrato. Yeah. We had some bomb sopranos. I mean, they could peel paint off of cars driving by at 80 miles an hour. <laughs> uh, and there were some really, really rough moments where we needed no vibrato. Mm. And either they didn't know how or they couldn't. What would you step into that situation and, and, and say? to mitigate that situation? Well, you know, I've had that with adults. Like Absolutely. if I work with an adult choir, older adults. Oh, you, you get some horrible. Yeah, and if you can get to straight tone, you're, you all of a sudden start singing in tune and you get, you know, about that. That's really scary and hard to do. I don't know. I would probably have them do one-on-one -on -one with each other and imitate like you would anything else. If you've got a person that can really do that, let them, let them work with a person that's not as good and let them work together. Not me telling them, but mm -hmm. let them work together. as Yeah. Players. And maybe work in there all, all over the place. See, like when you teach jazz scatting, um, one of the exercises is you do it all together. Like everybody's scatting all together so nobody makes a mistake. We'll do that maybe getting little duets all over the room and just work on straight tone with each other and everybody's doing it and it's a big mess and then you all come back together. That gets back to that singling out the one student. Right. Is that when someone's feelings are being, if not hurt, challenged, uh, it's because they feel that they're be being told that they, as a human, are bad. But if we could just all experience that challenge together, yeah. and remove the director, kind of remove the director from the situation. Yes. It's not director telling you you're wrong. It's yes. you are listening to the people around you. I think we get in our own way. Yes. Half the time, it's just talk, 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 talk. Shut up. <laughs> now, let, let Joyce over here, who knows how to do this, let her talk to Dana, who maybe doesn't. Let her teach because they they have similar voices. They're the same age, and nobody's a teacher there. And they can go and talk to each other. I I think that it, I think any time you get your kids teaching each other, you are and they're getting to know each other that way. Um, mm. Win 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 win. All righty. Well, I think we pretty much wrapped up this conversation. But thank you so much. I, I think we we put a lot of kernels in here that are are gonna plant some seeds all yeah, over the country. And, and, springboards, and, just yeah. ideas to make you think. Yeah, this is a great discussion to help uh, people choose that growth mindset when we're faced with some really challenging times. Absolutely. I, I've got a couple more questions, but I'm gonna end, end the recording here. Okay. Thanks so and much, Greg. You, hey, thank you, it's an honor. Thank you. My life goes on in How can I keep from seeing? Darkness around me close Songs in the night it giveth I hear the real though far off hymn That hails a new creation It sounds an echo in my soul Above earth my imitation My life flows on in endless song How can I keep from seeing my inmost call How can I keep from singing? How can I keep from singing? Won't 
See you.